What's up, Brandon Smiley here from BrandonSmiley.com, bringing you a Q&A session um, that I did, uh, asked on social media. Going to try to do these every few weeks, um, put out some content, I get some questions on YouTube and uh, my Facebook Messenger a lot, and um, it's really hard to give good answers through typing. Speaking is a little easier, plus giving out the information, I think it's just a better overall tool, and I might help me not get some of the same questions repeatedly. So first question comes from Paul from Instagram. This is not a serious question. Will you be shirtless? Can you be shirtless? Can I be shirtless? Will I be shirtless? I'm shirtless at least at some point every day. Um, I would prefer to be shirtless. And can he be shirtless? Paul, you can absolutely be shirtless. I think I've seen you shirtless at Raw Unity. It's looking pretty good. Hope you're doing alright, bud. Alright, another question comes from um, Katie Hake, who I actually went to grad school, or I'm sorry, who I went to undergrad with at Purdue. She said, what's your favorite way to schedule your training program? Three day split, four day split, every day, pros and cons of each. You're the bomb. Thanks for always dropping free knowledge bombs. We'll talk about a little question. Um... I personally, I guess the first thing I would preface, preface this with is what are you trying to do? What are your goals? Um, are you training for anything? That That's going to be the first question. Then from that you can stem based upon how many days you need to work out or train based upon your goals. So if you're just looking to maintain your general health and well-being, I would say two to three days of working out is probably going to be fine given that your nutrition is in pretty good um, control, um, you can make your changes through dietary changes, whether you want to lose fat, gain fat, two to three days a week, 30, 45 minute sessions, fine. That's why I work with a lot of my clients. They lose weight, put on muscle, improve body composition, whatever. For the next thing I want to cover will be time. How much time do you have? Um, some people, I don't believe there's an excuse for time other than time management. But there are people that do literally work 70, 80 hours a week. So for those people, it's going to be whatever you can get in. Ideally, I would say four days. I'm a four-day guy, especially for powerlifting. You can also look at your recoverability. Some people need three days. They need that extra day to recover. Um, I would not say every day. I currently train six days a week right now for regular training sessions to what I call mini sessions, which are blood flow light, nothing strenuous, nothing's heavy, nothing really even approaches like 30%. So that's not even a true actual workout. Yes, I get to actually lift, but I, I don't get sore. It actually helps make me less sore. Um, so the pros of less training is more recovery The and vice versa. So the more you train, the less recovery. And... I think that's how I'm going to kind of judge that because then based upon your goals, it's going to get a lot more specific. So I would say for the average person, three days is great. If you've got powerlifting or bodybuilding endeavors or sports performance endeavors, um, you can probably get four days a week, four days a week in off season for sports performance, two to three days a week for in season. Um, and then every other person is going to be somewhere in between. Next one on Instagram comes from uh, Nick Edmondson. Pretty barbell guy. He said, What's the ideal to snack on and drink in between lifts at meets? And will you be at our meet in February? Would love to see you there. Nick, I will be at your meet in February. Um, I pick one meet a semester to help you guys and go coach you all. And that's the meet you pick. That's the meet I go to. Um, no questions asked. Um, you guys are technically all my clients and people I work with. So that's a benefit and luxury of you. Um, being part of the club. That's my free helping hand. As for what to eat and drink on between a meat, first thing's going to be eat what you're normally used to eating. So if you eat junk food all the time, you can probably get away with junk food. If you eat really good, usually you're going to want to eat a little better on meat day. You don't want to cause any GI issues on the platform. Um, I would say that to drink, let me preface that, if you cut weight, it will also depend upon what you're eating and drinking to an extent because you will need to get your weight back on. So 
but generally speaking, Pedialyte, Gatorade, water are going to be the three big things. Um, the Gatorade you will want to mix half and half with water. Um, the mixture is not really right. It sits a little heavy in the stomach. Pedialyte's not as bad. You can drink Pedialyte pretty straight, but if you want to make it last longer, you can, you can mix half and half with water. Pedialyte's pretty expensive compared to Gatorade. Also, I personally use highly branched cyclic dextrin during meets because that's what I train with. Um, I train with anywhere from 25 to 50 grams during training. So I usually have 50 grams during the meet. I spread it out over about two liters, try to make that last. I make sure during warm-ups I'm drinking that. It's keeping me hydrated, keeping, keeping my glycogen source full, while also not giving me GI issues. That's a great positive thing about highly branched cyclic dextrin. Um, so Matt Caro asks, this is a long one, Carb cycling or strict ultra low carb for standard caloric deficit for super heavyweight looking to drop 20% body fat LMAO. Basically need to come down a good 70 pounds, sparing as much strength and muscle as possible. No carb seems to equal no pump or energy for me. Um, and just curious as to your approach and whatever you would recommend um, any type of carb depletion. Well, Matt, let me tell you, I am working with a client. I won't, I won't give his name for privacy reasons. We've been working together on you know, his last training block. So we're approaching 16 weeks. We're approaching uh, four months. We've taken him from like 297. I believe his weigh-in on Sunday this last week was 269. Um, so we've basically got him to drop 30 pounds in 16 weeks. That's a combination of things. I I am very fortunate that he has put his diet and his training in my hands, so I get to control both variables. You get some people where they want to go to one person for their diet, another person for their training, and then you've got to kind of play, connect the dots. Um, for the coaches, especially if they don't know each other, if they know each other, then you might ask them to talk every now and then. Um, so we're doing it through a couple of things. One, we're mainly doing it through caloric restriction. That's got to be number one. It's the first thing you got to focus around. Any coach that tells you otherwise is is uh, full of shit. So he's actually eating more carbs than he was when he came to me. And he was actually a little worried that I increased his carb intake and increased his protein intake and drastically dropped his fat intake. So the way that I looked at it is I wanted him to have ample energy to go into training sessions, feel good, do everything you can to maintain all the strength and all the muscle mass that you possibly can. So if you're gonna try to do that, you need to go in and be able to have the energy to give the intensity towards the training. Um, low carb has its place, and I'll get to that here in a minute. Um, but what else we do? He's got one cheat meal a week. I think we have it placed on Sunday at the moment. I basically give him a macro window and all, all he has to do is physically make the food fit that window. So if he can make a donut fit, he can have a donut. If he can make pizza, whatever. It's completely up to him. And that's how most of my coaching works. I don't give you eat chicken, rice, broccoli. I give you, I break your meals down for you into macros. Um, and I control your macronutrients at certain times. And that's what I want you to try to aim for. Um, so I'm controlling your calories, your macronutrients where they are and then I let you pick the foods however I give a food a list I guess you could say that I recommend that you stay to 90% and more of the time and then the other 10% if you happen to go off it's not the end of the world so that lets you about four to five meals a week to slip up or have a scoop of ice cream or have a donut or you know if your parents are going out and taking up for pizza eat the damn pizza Okay, it's not going to kill you for that one meal if you're good 95% of the rest of the time and your macronutrients are still pretty close. Um, so that's that. So what we do is we put most of his carbs around the training window. He trains early in the morning. So what we do is we load up the night before, morning, intra, post, and usually about three hours after the window. So he basically gets to eat from dinner to lunch with carbohydrates and then after that he's pretty much low carb the rest of the day um, 
and then we control that, and then he's training three days a week. We did add in some cardio. Uh, I've got him doing a day of cardio, but that's absolutely it. Um, and he's making good progress. So hats off to him. Hopefully that gives you an idea of what you could do, because it seems like you're both in very similar shoes, um, and I would probably take a very similar approach. But I would also need to see, you know, your own individual stuff to make it individual towards you because you're going to be different than him based on training schedule, recoverability, all that kind of stuff. Nutribio teammate Benjamin Michael asks, what's the best way to get acquainted with conjugate for raw lifters with minimal access to equipment like bands, chains, specialty bars, all that good stuff? Good question here. Really good question here. I think the first thing you need to do is make a list of what you do have access to. So let's just say you're at a regular gym, you've basically got bars, plates, and uh, we'll say that you have a power rack that's actually got pins. Um, we'll assume that you've got an adjustable bench that you can do incline, decline, um, overhead pressing. And we'll assume that you can box squat even if that results to you using a bench. So. We've got some pretty standard stuff. That's all pretty common, I think, in most um, gyms. I'm basically running off of what's at the rack that I work at. So, now that you have that, make some list of exercise variations that are possible for your max effort rotations. So, for bench press, let's see. We've got your competition grip. You've got your close grip. You've got a wide grip. You've got a floor press, close grip, floor press, wide grip, floor press, incline, close, and wide would not really recommend wide, but it is technically a variation. You have overhead press. Um, you can do JM presses, again, on the floor, um, on a regular bench. Those are probably the big ones that I would stay around. You can tend to do a spot press, um, but I like that more as a supplemental movement than a max effort. Same thing with wide grip bench. Uh, to me, that's more of a supplemental movement than uh, max effort. And you've also got pin presses, close grip pin presses, where you can adjust those. You can go to a hardware store, get some 2x4s, and make some board presses, and buy a band from the Lead FTS. It costs like 2 bucks. Wrap that thing around your chest and do it all the time. Or you can buy a shoulder staver. Either option works. Um, for squatting, you can do all sorts of box squat variations. Wide, narrow, low, high. Um, how long you sit on the box. Your bar position, high, low front squat, you've also got good morning, wide stance, good morning, close stance, good morning, good morning from pins, different pin variations, um, deadlift, again, you can use the good mornings, you can also do deficit pulls, you can vary the deficit, one plate, two plate, three plate, I wouldn't really suggest three plates, um, but one and two plates, definitely optional, you can do pin pulls, you can do block pulls, if you're not blocks, you can pull off of other plates, if they let you do that, um, you can do snatch rip deadlifts. Uh, you can do zerker pulls off the pins. Really, there's a lot of options. You just gotta think outside the box. Then you're basically gonna control how you rotate those. Again, that's all personal. Um, I like to rotate things in waves, but that's just me. For your speed work, you do not have to use bands and chains, but you're gonna have to increase your bar weight. So my suggestion for speed benching would be around Start around 50, 55% for anywhere from 10 to 8 triples. And you can wave that, like say 50, 55, 60. Um, speed deadlift, I think you can go a little heavier on this. <clears throat> I think you can start around 60% and go 60, 65, 70, or just stay with 60 and pull 10 singles. Speed squatting, again, you can use a box or not use a box. Um, I would. Say whichever one you do, you're probably going to again want to start around 50%, 50, 55, 60, 50, 53, 57, 60, however you want to wave it, around 10 to 12 doubles on the low end, 6 to 8 on the high end in terms of weight. So those are the main things. And you basically just got to break it down into what your training session is going to be. So you're going to pick a max effort movement, you're going to pick a supplemental movement, you're going to pick um, 1 to 2, I should say 1 to 3 accessory movements. Um, and then some abs or a finisher of some sort. So for squatting, it could be front squat, um, high bar pause squat, Bulgarian split squats, um, high rep leg presses, 
abs. Bench press could be close grip floor press, um, close grip pin press, um, and then you could do neutral grip dumbbell benching for high reps, um, dumbbell skull crushers, tape presses, dips, whatever, um, adult movement, side laterals or rear delt raises, and pull aparts, and then you can do some kind of finisher with some flies, press downs, whatever. And then dynamic and uh, days would basically be very similar, but you're doing speed and then you do a little bit more accessory work towards your weaknesses.